Welcome to Real Estate Radio Live, an informative and engaging podcast discussing everything you need to know about the world of real estate. Your host, Joe Kachera, provides you with insight and guidance on how to buy, sell, finance, and invest in real estate. He also offers real estate tax management strategies, new construction advice, home improvement tips, and much, much more. And now, to guide you around the world of real estate, here's your host and Real Estate Radio Live team leader, Joe Kachera. Welcome in, Joe Kachera with Real Estate Radio Live. Thank you for those that are following us on Facebook. We continue to grow that audience, and we appreciate it very much. We want to continue to use any kind of technology resources we can to grow the audience. Of course, this is a podcast, so if you're watching the show and you have not downloaded the podcast, please do us a favor, download the podcast. You go anywhere online and just type in Real Estate Radio Live. You go to iTunes and find the podcast, download it, and uh, that way you can follow the show anytime, anywhere at your convenience. The focus has been the same for almost eight years since I've been doing the live radio show and podcast, and that is education and information. So uh, we work really hard, have great guests, great partnerships like today to provide you, the consumer, with as much education and information as we can, typically around real estate. However, what we've done is switch things up a little bit in the last year or so. We brought on Jack Russo, who has uh, done a great job, and we started a show, was it last year, on uh, starting something new in Silicon Valley? All right, it's just about a year ago. Yeah. We did a lot of shows that talked about starting. Right. And this year we're now turning to growing. Right. And growing is really an important thing to think about because really you want to get out of the starting gate and want to get to the point where you're actually growing. And conceptually, you know, it's easy to start. It's hard to grow. A lot of businesses True. get started. I'm mm-hmm. sure, Steve, we have a guest today, a great guest, CPA, Steve Raven. Steve is going to tell us more about what he sees because really a lot of people don't go to their CPAs. The thesis, I say, and this ties to sort of the seven mm-hmm essences of growth that we talked about in the series, the team has to build people around it Mm -hmm. that can really amplify the team. And so the lawyer becomes important, the accountant becomes important, the right consultants become Mm -hmm. important, the right money finders become important. There's so many different people around it that if you don't have those people, it's sort of like you're you don't have the 10 gears on your 10-speed bike. Now, of course, it's like 18 or 21-speed. <laughs> can't even get a three. Years ago, I used to bicycle that? with a three-speed Raleigh right. from, you know, I was back in my college days from Brooklyn over the Brooklyn Bridge. You're an East Coaster, so you'll get a kick out of this. Over the Brooklyn Bridge up to 82nd Street in Manhattan on a three-speed yeah. Raleigh with a little clicker. You can't even find that anymore. That's People so would funny. laugh at yeah. me. Saying, you take that that many miles. I said, well, I don't like going by train, and I can't take the bike in the train because the subway <laughs> system didn't right. have bikes. I mean, here on BART, you can take the bike. <laughs> but anyway, I thought bringing Steve in, we got reacquainted, and I said, Steve, hey, why don't you come on the show because you could fit right yeah. into the team because I don't want to leave the team where we left it because it's such a big topic. Mm-hmm. And the other six essences are pretty important, and people will listen to them and say, why are you focusing on the team? The team really has to be amplified and extended to accomplish everything Mm -hmm. you need to accomplish. And if you don't have a good lawyer and a good accountant, you're really missing two of the key legs. Obviously, the team is the third leg and a lot more. But if you don't have all those people around Mm -hmm. you, so I thought, Steve, you know, introduce yourself. You've been an accountant for many years, decades now, although you still look young. you got two gray (laughs) hairs since I last saw you, but I do as well. But tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, thank you for having me. You're welcome. Yeah, you're welcome. Welcome, of course. In. Of course. Amen. It takes a village to raise a child. Right. And um, a company is sort of yeah. like that. And a uh, good lawyer is key. And if the company doesn't have a good lawyer, then they'll start asking their accountant for legal advice. Right. <laughs> and the accountant will say, no, I can't do that ethically. And Steve is one of the most ethical people you're ever going to find because he doesn't really go beyond the swim lane of being an accountant. What I like about him is you can give him a messy situation from an accounting point of view, and it doesn't scare him. He's like, I've seen it before. I've done it before. I've done it at big firms before. I've done it at my own firm. I can do it, and I can do it within a budget. And I tell you, it's so refreshing to have that happen because a lot of people will say this is radioactive, particularly the big firm people. They'll be like, get me a retainer of $50,000, and I might tell you next week whether I can even handle Uh, it. And the reality (laughs) is a roll-the-sleeves-up person like Steve can go in there 
with himself look at stuff and say, mm-hmm. I've seen this before. Let's get to the heart of what you really have to do, right. and let's get it done. And I love that. I mean, yeah. I love when that happens. And we've had those cases, as I've said, <laughs> said Steve, some really messy stuff. And, you know, there are a lot of people that start and they get going before they really even put together their QuickBooks, which is shocking. Hard to believe. Uh, shocking, I'm glad true. that I got started early on with that. But we were talking a little bit about that. So you you see that a lot. Guys that made a month, two months, six months, a year down the road, all of a sudden they have a couple of boxes full of documents uh, going, what do I do with it? I have to tell you that <laughs> there, there, there have been, and I'll just put this on the table because it's a debatable yeah. point, there have been people that have questioned, if we have limited dollars, should we spend it on legal or should we spend it on accounting? Uh-huh. And I'll tell you something, the lawyers will almost always send it on legal sure. because they're biased. Sure. The accounts will almost always say, well, can you do it yourself? If you can do it yourself, maybe you should spend it on the lawyers. Yeah. But if you can't do it yourself, the better answer is actually you probably should spend that money on your accountants. Mm. Because if you don't get those books set up correctly right away or early enough, mm-hmm. your eventual investor is going to say, this is too messy right. and something's wrong here and it right. smells. Right. Even if the legal is sort of done, you know, half right, which is not good either. Mm-hmm. So it's like six of one, half dozen of another. The truth is you need both. Yeah. But the truth is a lot of people can do the accounting stuff with QuickBooks these days if it's simple enough and there yeah. aren't lots of issues. Right. Oftentimes, for a simple company, you're just losing money. Yes. So you can just yes. keep losing money, yeah. <laughs> and it's easy because you take money in and you lose it, and the account's not worried about taxes because, hey, you've lost money. I mean, it's nothing to report other than that you have a loss. But, Steve, you tell us what you see because you see all yeah. the full range of stuff, But right? you still, before you get started, yeah. but you still, even though you're losing money, everybody wants to know where it's being spent. That's right. Right? That's right. Yeah. Yeah. They you do. know, I've seen a, a little bit of, about of each, and as you say, you need it all. Mm-hmm. But sometimes I'll even tell the client to spend it on marketing. Mm. Yep. And if you don't have a customer, you, you don't have any money coming in, you don't have a business. Mm-hmm. Right. And then maybe it's time to close up and do something more useful with your time. It's probably a better way to answer when you get to the fork (laughs) of the road, take it, but go with marketing and sales first because we've had, of course, as you know, we've had people on that really look at things and they say, you know, Steve from Uber, of course, you know, Steve's view is you got to understand whether you have a sellable product and you may not find that out without Mm -hmm. doing some initial marketing that tests whether or not there really is something mm-hmm. here. Yeah. Because what if you find <clears throat> out this is a beautiful thing, but no one really wants it? Good point. A lot of people build yeah. stuff and say they will come once we right. build it. Right, And the truth is it's not there. There really isn't, you know, there really isn't something True. yet that Very people good point. want. I mean, Google <laughs> is coming out with Google Glass 2 as AR glasses. Mm. Google Glass 1 seems to have failed. Mm. You don't hear about it anymore. They probably spent a billion dollars trying to make that thing work, and that's Google with mm-hmm. that brand. Right. You would think they could. They're at it again with a second version. When you look at it, and there are pictures of it, it's just a light frame set of glasses. Mm. And they look like they may have figured out the market, but oh. there are people that are saying, well, the price is still too high. Mm. If the price is not like a set of glasses, meaning under 100 bucks. It's sort of a thousand or fifteen hundred or yeah. album version. So you know you see these <laughs> things. So you gave the right answer, which is well, maybe neither lawyers nor accountants. Maybe you got to get a marketing guy. I think so. Now in that particular case, I'm wondering what is the problem that it solves. Because yes. I understand the product, I don't understand the, the use case. The use and case I've seen. I go to a doctor. She's actually very good for you know someone who's my male doctor died in a bicycle accident, which mm. was a shock because the guy was in perfect health, right? So they assign you a doctor. Right. You don't even get right. to choose anymore. So I go to her. She's got Google Glasses on. So I said to her, what are you doing? She says, well, we record everything now. I said, why? No, she says, I don't have to type anything anymore. And she said, yeah, a lot of people don't like it because they feel like, you know, there's somebody in India listening to the oh, conversation. Okay. So we have to have, you sign all these waivers. They're a lawyer. Go read it. Stack of paperwork <laughs> just to go get your annual exam. That's and I'm amazing. Like, I'm like, well, Dr. So-and-so, my previous mail doctor, says, yeah, this is the way the world is going. Huh? So there are use cases. That was Google Glasses 1, which are big and thicker. And now there's a lightweight version. Mm-hmm. You know, we don't want to talk about Google and give them all this PR time. We want to talk about Steve. But, Steve, tell us a little bit, like, 
how you made your journey to Silicon Valley, because my recollection is you started on the East Coast. Am I, I did. That right? I, I grew up in New York City. Please yeah. uh, don't tell, yeah, don't don't tell anybody. Against you, right? <laughs> now, this makes you savvy. That just makes you smart and savvy. Yeah. Right? But tell us where you went to school and kind of how you made your way west. Go west, young man. Go west, right? I came here to go to college at Caltech way back when and liked it so much, uh, both the weather, the people, the country, I decided to stay. And um, I went on to get an MBA and a CPA license, a certified public accountant license. As well, I'm uh, a certified valuation analyst. So I've helped grow uh, dozens of startups, um, some to successful exits with public company acquisitions, reverse mergers, things like that. And over the years, also done a fair amount of tax. I've probably been responsible for over $100 million in favorable tax adjustments for my clients. That's huge. I mean, that's huge. And those certifications are not trivial because... Mm -hmm. To get the CPA certification, you have to take a bunch right. of exams, right. and they're hard, and you mm-hmm. have to pass them, so it's like a bar exam. Yeah. And then you really actually have to practice. Like, you have to actually be in the practice mm-hmm. of accounting, like public accounting. It's not trivial. You know, you can become a lawyer and pass the bar and then mm-hmm. never actually practice, and you're still technically a lawyer, and there right. are a <laughs> few people like that. Yeah. They end up, like, working as clerks or law professors. They don't actually know how to practice law, yeah. whereas you actually spend time with the big, oh, you got your card here. Oh, yeah, yeah. There you go. See, one of my CPA licenses But what, where did you practice? Weren't you with a big firm for a while? I remember I, part I've, of the story. I've worked for a half dozen small to tiny to small firms. Mm-hmm. Uh, right. So I've never actually worked at a huge firm. I've worked for people who came from huge firms. I guess one of my early experiences uh, after transitioning from technology to accounting was at a manufacturer at what was supposed to just be a three-month job. But at the end of the three months, my boss quit. Mm-hmm. You, so became, you became you promoted. Couldn't you take were it promoted. anymore. So everything on her desk got moved to my desk without any pay increase. Of course. They just said, how would you like a new business card with a new title? Thank uh, you very much. I right? was actually a contractor, so they didn't even give me a business card. And <laughs> I found myself in charge of tax for a multi-billion dollar manufacturer with 25 years of back taxes in litigation. Ouch. Senior IRS executive, full time on site to handle the government side of the litigation. So this is like this is like Chernobyl <laughs> of tax and accounting problems, right? And I learned so much from right. that experience right. that it just propelled my career and my practice. And that was the base. Having okay. learned how to solve their disputes, I learned a lot about what matters and what doesn't matter. And that right. goes back to the questions you asked earlier, and really. Somebody who doesn't know will say, do everything by the book. And, you know, there's some things that are in the book that nobody really cares about. Right. And so the important thing is what's important and uh, things like uh, doing payroll correctly. Yeah, that's a big one. A lot of officers and directors don't get that they have personal exposure for payroll obligations. Mm. But here's how it gets trickier. What does it mean to have a payroll obligation? What if you say, well, I just hire a bunch of contractors. Yeah. I have a case right now. Steve's probably going to hear about it after the show because I've been thinking I've yeah. got to get Steve involved. All the people are showing up to work at the home of the founder oh, CEO boy. with regular hours, with regular desks, with that's their job. Not the they're residents, for, though. But they're all contractors, no mm, payroll. Interesting. And I keep saying to them over and over again, you can't continue this. You shouldn't have started it. You're going to have a bunch of exposure, the people on your board. Yeah. And they're like, but we, we're we trying to save money. We have limited runway. This is how everyone does it in Silicon Valley. Where have you been, Jack? And I said, look, the rules have changed in California. Right. It's very hard to have a contractor <clears throat> with a regular gig. Even Uber is facing this, and Lyft. It's a regular gig, True. and it's once it's a regular right. gig, the ABC test right. in California. And that changes the deal, because if you're a board member or a director, you, have, and Steve, can flush this out, personal exposure, not only mm-hmm. for the back taxes, but for the penalties, mm. which are not trivial, right? They're and and it's not just your current board members. It's anyone you try and recruit to become a board member or officer. It's any acquirer. It's an outside CPA can be held personally responsible. I can lose my house 
for taking this client on. Right. How mm-hmm. weird is that? Think about the toxic risks of this because if you don't do this right, it means when you go out for your financing, they're going to say, but this company is radioactive for this violation mm-hmm. of law. We don't want to put anyone on the board. Right. But we're not going to put fifty million or five right. million or even five hundred thousand in yeah. to an entity that's radioactive. Mm-hmm. The Chernobyl analogy is playing. Any right now. professional who's worth their salt has a line of good clients. Yes, waiting. And yes. why would I take this bad but, client but and you lose see, my house? But you see CEOs and all the time that'll say, "But I don't have enough runway. I so got to get it done when I got to get like, done." Be like Theranos. That's yeah. not good. <laughs> you know. Your chances of getting caught are 100%. So not only does that zero in the payroll tax paid um, line on your tax return just say, audit me, audit Mm -hmm. me, please audit me. But every time somebody leaves the company, all your ex-employees, all your ex-girlfriends, your (laughs) ex-boyfriends, you know, Somebody leaves a company, they apply for state unemployment. Oh, there you what go. What does the state That's a do? That's a trigger. That's a they trigger. They list your employers for the last three yeah. years, yes. and you don't know the difference between a contract, a mm-hmm. client, and an employer, so right. you list the company. And then the company gets a nice letter from the state saying, um, this person was an employee, mm-hmm. and you owe right. uh, how many other um, right. employees have you misclassified? Right. Oh, you have no employees. Let's right. take a closer look. <laughs> well, yeah, that looks really weird. But tell us how you transitioned to accounting, because you were in science before, right? You were headed to Caltech for some sort of science degree, right? I, you know, I started out in engineering and technology, okay. being one of those people you just yeah. I talked about who right. I doesn't really have a clue. <laughs> <laughs> really smart scientifically, but I mean, look, that's the reality. There are a lot of people that come up with brilliant ideas, yep. but they're not business savvy, right. and they never will that's be, right. and they don't want to be. Right. I mean, they want to do their science or they want to do their technology. I mean, Elon Musk violates SEC rules all the time, or you know, allegedly. I guess I should put allegedly in so we don't get sued for libel here. But generally, he's sort of like oblivious. He thinks the SEC is a monster yeah. and thinks they're trying to invade his First Amendment rights. <laughs> but when you came out to Caltech, you decided, hey, this is far better than the East Coast, and I'm staying. But then you shifted to accounting. And where's the MBA from? Where did you get the MBA as part of this? Right. The MBA was from um, Keller Graduate School of Management, which uh, doesn't have nearly the same reputation as Caltech. Uh, right, because <laughs> um, right, Caltech uh, is like a top ten university, right, it, particularly it, for science It's and probably the best technology school in the world. Short of MIT. Uh, some people who went to MIT might disagree. Right, of course. <laughs> I mean, that's the typical thing. But the way I met you was from a referral to a PhD from Caltech, mm-hmm. I think, if I remember, Mike Krieger, who was co-counsel with me on a case, you know, and we uh-huh. were talking, hey, I need some help with this radioactive accounting uh-huh. situation. He said, great, <laughs> let me make a suggestion to you, and that's how we met. So uh-huh. it's an interesting okay. way of yeah. networking begets further networking, which begets further yes. networking, right. so it's quite valuable. So you see a lot of these startups, and payroll is one issue you see, but what else do you see that can generate lots of problems when you see it? it? You know, again, and I'm going to slightly harp on it, it's the marketing thing. As technologists, we are often looking at things with the eyesight of a creator, and it's a product, the product, the product. Yes. But really, what's the benefit that the product creates? Right. There's a big difference. Right. And until you can communicate that benefit, yes. you don't get that line of clients. Yes. So back to the vision thing, so it saves us from taking notes about what happened in the operating theater, yes. but that's just a few bucks worth of savings. So right. w- can we dig into that and find the real benefit? Right. Maybe it prevents malpractice lawsuits. Right. Right. The real benefit often is hidden by the fact that a lot of people don't get outside their office or outside their desk mm. to talk to customers. Steve King of yeah. Connect Force talks about this all the time, which is you got to actually get in front of the customer totally agree. and understand the pain. Right. And is the pain substantial enough to get above all the other distractions of life to yeah. do a deal? Yeah. And you can't get that to happen without actually sitting down with them. Well, yeah. And if you don't get to that step, yeah. it's inevitable. <clears throat> and, you know, it's funny because I see this over and over again. There is such a belief by so many inventors, and I've got a case right now. It's going to go to trial. I just finished a case. That's why you haven't seen me for a number of weeks. <laughs> I've been, you know, trying a case. Hopefully, great result. But when you look at these situations where people spend a fortune building something, mm-hmm. and then there's like, where are the customers? 
why aren't they appearing? Amazing. We, we said if we yeah. build this ballpark, right. we'll get people to come. Right. We'll have fans. We'll have a stadium full of people. It doesn't play out One that of the way. most documented one that we've talked about before is Webvan. Remember Webvan? Yes, yes. Convinced. And it convinced. seemed like, Very on the convinced. surface, a great idea, right? It was a great idea that was ahead of its time right. and right. ahead of all the little other infrastructure right. elements. There was a lot of different pieces. Even when you look at things like the iPhone, there were so many failures before mm-hmm. the iPhone, which is an immensely successful product beyond mm-hmm. everyone's dreams. I mean, literally wiped out so many other companies that were in the cellular phone era. But they were able to get the right device at the right time with all the infrastructure around mm-hmm. it. You know, we have a similar thing now playing out around 5G. Mm-hmm. What is the next right. big thing that's going to happen around right. 5G? Around that 5G. ties to sort of this notion of wearables, which ties to all the failures that have happened up to now. Yeah. So it's an interesting situation. Yeah. But do you think there's some special magic in Silicon Valley? We've been going back and forth mm-hmm. about this. You have the team. The team has an idea that they're trying to turn into technology. Hopefully they have good people like you, me, people like Joe, people like Steve that are kind of helping in an advisory role or otherwise. But what do you see as the magic? Because you've obviously seen the valley grow. We know from the traffic that it's grown. We know how hard it is these days to buy a house around <laughs> here. <laughs> it's real easy to sell a house. It is. We're going to have someone on the show who's now exiting Silicon Valley. Oh, good. We'll have him towards the end. That's and he good. talks about, hey, man, I didn't need to plan for my retirement. I just sold my just house. Sold. I'm fine. I'm fine. He's moving overseas. Yeah. I mean, we'll talk about him. But what do you see? If you've been here long enough, what do you see as the magic? I think the magic is the companies that really get it. It's a pool of talent yes. that we can find. Yes. It's the infrastructure, having people like Jack and me here to help. Mm-hmm. And uh, these companies then go on to dominate in their fields. I was recently advising to Briterion, the artificial intelligence company mm-hmm. that just exited it by being acquired by MasterCard. Nice. And Those are the guys that had billboards along they 101. Still have they still have these big these billboards big, along oh, 101. Oh, okay. and so yeah, that's the blue billboards. The, yeah, I can remember it. It's, it's got like the, the picture of the light bulb yeah, going and on. And underneath the company name is the byline, Mission Critical Artificial Intelligence. Yes. And they've kind of gotten it. They're just saying what the benefit is, not just what they do. I'll tell you, they built up to the point where half the transactions, credit card transactions worldwide, were being approved by their system. Mm -hmm. And once you have such a dominant position in a niche, you know, artificial intelligence in some ways at this time, I think, is still a solution looking for a problem. Yes, right. But they found this one problem, just like the operating theater for the vision, there's one area of credit card approval that they could dominate. Right. And once you can do that, then a bank that's looking for a credit card approval processing mm-hmm. will come to mm-hmm. you because mm-hmm. you have WorldPay, you have MasterCard. Yep. Yep. Mm-hmm. And I just feel privileged to have been associated with that well, success. Well, that's, that's a big that feather in your cap. I hope you got a lot of stock is. from them. But, of course, you can tell me, no, as a CPA, I can't <laughs> no, get any stock at a, all, as right? As a CPA, I'm not allowed to. See, people don't that. know that. When yeah. you bring in the CPA, they have... A separate set of ethical rules. So they can't they uh, cannot participate. Invest. Really? They cannot invest. They're viewed as you mm. have to have independence wow. in the true old style way that lawyers mm. used to have independence. Okay. Right. Said years ago, you know, the criticism the criticism years ago when I was at my previous firm, right. Fenwick and West, we don't take stock. This is years ago. Now they've changed their mind. Right. That's why we didn't take Apple stock. Why? We have to have independence. We don't want anyone saying, you're just doing it because you're right. a shareholder. Right. You're doing it because you're the lawyer. <coughs> now, Wilson Sonsini upstairs was making millions, maybe tens of millions, maybe mm-hmm. now billions. And they were like one of the biggest funds, mm-hmm. side funds that ever existed. Those guys were like buying private jets and taking <laughs> off for the weekend. And we're like hacking away in our law offices and saying, what's going on? Well, they took stock they took in their stock. startups. Yeah. Now, that changed, but in the CPA profession, that doesn't change. Independence is a real thing, right? You said the E word, yes. the ethics word. Yes. I was just yeah. reading uh, an article that mentioned uh, apparently PwC did a recent study on causes for CEO departure, and they found that right now 39% of CEO departures are caused by ethical lapses, wow. yes. which is more than That's the amazing. departures caused yes. by 
a poor financial performance. Yes. Wow. Yes. So if you don't take it seriously, I think um, you might want to consider doing so. When I switched from technology to accounting, I discovered that in technology, the, uh, just about the only ethical challenge is, is doing something r- wrong and fessing up mm-hmm. and being willing to admit yeah, one's right, mistakes yes, or right, right. one's company's right. mistakes. <coughs> that might happen once or twice in a career, Yes. whereas every tax return yes. that a CPA scientist prepares mm-hmm. is a conflict between a client who might want to pay nothing and right. a government who might want everything it's entitled to. Well, that's what I was trying to figure out. They're after Trump's returns and data and all that jazz, and I keep trying to wonder, like, the people, the lawyers that use really sort of high-end law firm to sort of give legal advice on, I guess it's Lazar's, that's the accounting firm, at the or Mazar's, that's the accounting firm. They're in the news now. Mm, Mazar's, yes. Yeah. So, you know, those lawyers are using exceptional ways to make the tax right. zero or, <laughs> or maybe not, non-existent or very low. Yeah. And, you know, what's going to come out eventually, my prediction, is – hey, they did a lot of really super smart things that other people should emulate, <laughs> but then there'll be a bunch of legislation that says we just can't allow that to happen yeah. because then we won't have enough tax revenue right. to deal with all these <coughs> programs that yeah. we have. But maybe that's going to be the ascendancy of the Trump presidency, which is going to lead to a lot of tax reform, yeah. right? Uh, oddly enough, right? So when you look at a company, let's just focus for a few minutes on this, and you are trying to decide on an engagement. You look at the talent because, obviously, that's key, whether they're going to succeed or not. You hope, cross your fingers, they'll succeed, like the one that you just had that you helped get them going and sold off. Do you actually look at the technology and try to understand, does this thing have a half a chance to succeed? Because we often do that at our firm, and we'll say to people up and down in the initial meeting, we don't think that's doable in this mm-hmm. lifetime. And, you know, bravo for you if you can pull it off. But we're not going to, like, bet because we do these deferred fee mm-hmm. deals and sometimes, you know, write off all of our fees. We don't think you can do it. We don't think it's right. doable. We think it's a little bit like a perpetual motion machine. Mm. It can't happen without some sort of, like, major, major change. And I saw a lot of really good ones that I was wrong about. I mean, I saw Salesforce.com at the very, very <laughs> beginning. And knock on wood, or knock on wood, I'm still alive, but knock on wood that I'm so stupid that I didn't invest in that. <laughs> and I'll tell you something. You know, when I look back on that one investment, it's a little bit like yeah. my old law firm, yeah. <laughs> Apple Computer. Right. Let's look at about that. They say, why didn't I see that the world was going to the cloud? Yeah. No one believed back yeah. then that the cloud could be secure right. enough. Well, it turns out maybe it's not secure enough, but people are still marching their way to the mm-hmm. cloud. Yeah. And it's like, you know, security will get fixed. Yeah. But I didn't see it. I didn't think that all that data off-site, I thought people would get nervous about it. So I couldn't believe in it. But that was a huge mistake. It turned <laughs> out it was really there. Yeah. I mean, you must see stuff like that all the time, right? Absolutely, and I take less of an investment position in my clients, so I you don't take a zero position. Need you're to, a zero. You're I'm, a zero investor. Well, I'm, I'm investing my time. Your time. And yeah. It's re- building relationships. Right. And so, to some extent, there is an investment, but I do less due diligence or cynical thinking about their potential. I do look a little bit at the marketing. To some extent, that's an area of potential improvement. If the marketing sucks, then that's mm-hmm. an opportunity. Speaking of opportunities, today I spent at least 10 minutes receiving security verification text messages on my cell phone, those six-digit numbers. Oh, yeah, yeah. right. Text you. And, uh, you know, 10 minutes a day times 200 days in a year. Times 300 million people or whatever number are actually working in the United States. Whatever bill rate. You know, this is a problem. Yes, it is. You know, and I don't think Google is or the makers of these systems are particularly thinking of the needs of the end user. Yeah. I don't want to lose 10 minutes of my day, and right. it's only going to grow to Good point. copying these yeah. silly verification texts. You know, um, my cell phones still do pocket dialing. Yes. It's down a lot from when I first um, bought <laughs> right. an Android. Right, but, but it's embarrassing, right? You know, it calls my client list at random. Yeah. And then they hear the sound of my keys jingling. <laughs> <from> my <laughs> cell phone. Oh, brother. We, so, got a, we got just a couple more minutes, so I want to make sure we get the summary in here of what our final thoughts are on, you know, working with startups, the value of the CPA. I think we certainly covered that. Getting someone like Steve, right? Steve. I mean, it's, it's incredible. And then do you see, it sounds like you do, Jack, you too, do you see a lot of 
startups with the need that it's, uh, again, I know it sounds funny, it may looks funny, you probably see it, boxes full of documents saying, I just didn't know how to start, where do we start? <laughs> do you get that kind of stuff? Yeah, it depends. The proactive ones will come to us early, and then their problems are relatively minimal. Oh, okay. And no, no good yeah. stories there. But right. a lot of them, they do their own thing for a ways, and they wake up when they get the audit notice from the IRS mm -hmm. or, or when the due diligence notice from the financiers or right. the acquirers comes in, and, oh, my gosh, it's a mess. And then mm. there's dozens, hundreds I've seen at one point, I had 80,000 crates of documents. Oh, 80? Um, 80,000 crates. 80 oh, with three documents. zeros at the end. That's huge. And not 80,000 documents, 80,000 yeah. crates. Yeah. My God. So that's like 10 million documents or more. And, that's a huge number. Um, so, yes, we get that. Yeah. <laughs> I, mean, <laughs> I mean, and these sure. days, it's so convenient to start a QuickBooks account. Yeah, right. You can even get one, I think, for free or, you know, deferred for six months. It's right. a little bit like they want to suck you in sure. because... Once they have you, it's pretty hard to move right. off. I bet most of your small clients, the ones I see, most of mine, are on some version of QuickBooks. Yeah, that's what you use. And, yeah. and, you know, QuickBooks is okay, and I think, you know, it's been subject to criticism, but you're better off having something than nothing, what I say, and you're better off having some systemization of how you're keeping track of expenses and the like. So some people like to take photographs these days and attach right. them to a record. There's something there because when you get the audit, and you know this better than I do, the theory of it is if you don't have a record to substantiate, well, then the expense didn't exist. Or you're sort of presumed to have to keep records, even though I think the law is actually slightly better if you actually got into a legal yeah. fight with the IRS where, hey, if there's sort of like, you know, mileage on a car, we know that you're using the car to make sales calls. Okay, you'll correct me on this, but there's ways to estimate. But it's far better to have records and to keep the right, records. Right, right. These days, the storage is so cheap right. that keeping the records online yeah. is better than nothing at all. And yeah. I know that you'll tell me, well, there's better ways to do it. But what do you like to see when you see a startup? Obviously, QuickBooks would be a start, right? You know, some demonstration of good intent, intent mm -hmm. in doing the right thing. Yes. You know, the, this quick answer is pigs get fed, but hogs get slaughtered. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. And if you're standing near the edge of the cliff, you're probably okay if there's somebody closer to the edge than you are. Right. Yeah. Somebody, right. somebody big is closer right. to the edge. But you see it all the time when you help people with these complex finances mm -hmm. where they've got multiple collateral right. and you're kind of cross- collateralizing right. stuff, people don't realize they have to demonstrate that they really have some equity in this oh, yeah. property. Right. And that, you know what, we really rent it and the rent really comes in and there's really <laughs> like a lease agreement. And, right. you know, people, if they haven't gone through it, newbies, particularly startup newbies that might be right out of school, if they haven't gone through it, they have no idea that, well, people might actually ask me for those records, and I yeah. have to actually put They're like, aren't they private? Can I, just <laughs> give, can I just say, like, my estimate is this? And the answer is no. Well, now when you start taking people's money, and it's yes. good to hear Steve say this because I was fortunate with Jack's guidance to hire a CPA right away and pay them monthly to do the QuickBooks. And right. now there's a system in place where it's very systematic, and I could have thought about spending that money different. It's not a ton of money, but the point is, you know, I think anybody that starts looking at those financials right now, we're getting ready to raise more money and do some additional things. That's going to be a benefit, my guess. It's a huge right? benefit. It's a huge benefit, and I think it gives the company a lot more credibility. Right. And having someone on the team that can actually sign off, because there is the independence. Right. Of someone like Steve, I don't know if you're still actually doing audits because that's kind of like big liability these days, right, for a small <laughs> I, player to do. I do, do not do audits, and to slight a point that you just touched on, um, yes, expenses are important, but the two critical things ahead of expenses mm -hmm. are the payroll. Mm -hmm. Payroll cannot be zero. Okay. Um, officers are statutory employees. And if the company is making money, the officer must be on right. payroll. And then the equity section is also, I think, mm, even more point. important than yeah, the right. expense section. Right. And there's a lot of tools now to put yeah. all the equity right. stuff online, so that's a good movement. There's a company that just got funded, they're a unicorn called Carta. Oh, yeah. That's allowing yeah. all this stuff right. to kind of go online. Right. It's amazing to me that this stuff exists. But more yeah. and more, it just seems, though, the tools exist, but then it's all about will the team take the time to do mm -hmm. it because their head is usually in 
we're doing R and D, we're developing a product. Right. They're not even talking to a customer. They're just right. like hacking away a right. code that they think will be really <laughs> valuable. But when a yeah. large, a multi-million dollar infusion comes in or an exit happens, yes. somebody like Jack will have to sign off on the equity section. Yes. Right. And right. if it's not clean, you're going to pay a half million dollars to clean it up. Right. That's wow. the bad part. So you want to do things right. You want to have the right people. You want to have team members that help you, guide you along the way. And you want to anticipate that there will be questions, mm-hmm. there will be judgment calls, I mean, look at Trump. I, I got to believe he never imagined, oh, running for president, I might actually have to open my books up. Right. Maybe I should think twice about whether I want to do that. <laughs> because as much as he, according to all the books that are being written, I haven't read all of them, read a few of them, it's like he never expected to win. This was like the biggest PR right. of all lifetime. <laughs> and now people are predicting maybe he actually wants to be impeached. Yeah. Like he's oh, looking forward to it. <laughs> like, like he's like throwing the gauntlet down. Well. So I look at this and I say, boy, you know, it cannot be a non-stressful thing to be yeah. him, even yeah. if no, he's a billionaire, cannot. right? Even cannot. if he's a billionaire. Well, before we duck out, I'll make sure, Steve, for those that may be starting a business, thinking about starting a business, I mean, this is really valuable information. Jack, thanks for having Steve sure, on. Sure, Steve's great. So, Steve, Delighted. give your information out, contact information for those that may have questions or may want to think about working with you or consult with you or confide in you or you know there's all kinds of things they may need from you <laughs> sure my website is tax service to you that's a number two in the letter u okay. dot com and even better steve's got an easy email which is his name s raven first initial s r a b i n at s raven dot com so you right. got his name yeah. as a dot com so you're way ahead of most people because most people hey my name is taken <laughs> and steve's very responsive by email okay. so probably should give your phone number too yeah. steve well, i know most people don't use the phone anymore that's like so <laughs> so so 19th century you know to use sure. the phone you can also reach me by phone uh, 408-887-6433 right. very good and, Jack, for those, sure. remind everybody that can sure. reach you. Jack Russo, managing partner, computer law group in Palo Alto, and we have a small office in San Francisco as well. We're growing a practice there because people don't want to commute <laughs> to Silicon Valley. They're like, you know, I don't want to kill half my day going right. up and down 101 or 280. 650-327-9800, and it's Jay Russo, J-R-U-S-S-O, at computer law, it's all one word, C O M P U T E R L A W dot com. I know it's kind of long, but <laughs> it was, it's become kind of almost a famous mark because people are like, man, that was an early catch yeah, that, that was. you got. That really I, was. I regret not getting the Russo name. Then I could be <laughs> Jack at Russo dot com, but somebody right. else has it. So if a potential client does not use computers, can they still call they you? They still call <laughs> In fact, we have a division of the firm we call the Entrepreneur Law Group or ELG and CLG. There you go. We work together because the division of the firm just does and looks at startups and mm-hmm. sometimes helps really helping startups kind of get out of the right. garage. And often that's even before anything has happened. Yeah. Like literally, maybe there's a domain name Just and an, an idea, idea <laughs> and people are percolating around, what should we do with this? Is this worth anything? And oftentimes amazing things get launched. Well, how, but discussion. keep in mind, that being said, Every single business, doesn't matter if it's Google or the guy that's cutting lawns, it started with a name started and probably a, a website, right, and, a domain. Yeah, and, an, <laughs> and an idea. Or an the, idea, I should and say. And the really good yeah. ones, the collaborations that are really good, they start to keep track, particularly with things like yeah. the Google online suite of documents, uh-huh. of like what's the latest addition to the list of ideas that we're not sure mm. we can execute on, but we're putting in the list because we think – some combination will come out of it, yeah. and then we'll do kind of a <coughs> monthly or quarterly meeting with our advisors. Hey, yeah. we've been thinking about this. Is this worth a project? Is this worth talking to some customers about? Yeah. Maybe there's an opportunity here. There's all kinds yeah. of little ideas really that become really big things. It really is. All right, we're going to wrap things up. Again, I would recommend, for those who follow the show, you know, we have a large following, thousands and thousands of downloads a month. If you're thinking about starting a business, you have a friend, family member, coworker, have them contact someone like Jack or Steve. These are the things you're going to hear over and over again. It's more than just a coincidence. Successful businesses get started, and they get started the right way. Right, that's true. <laughs> Thanks for having me. Yeah, you're welcome. Appreciate it. This is Joe Kuchera with Real Estate Radio Live. Thanks again for tuning in. Take care. Have a great afternoon. You've been listening to Real Estate Radio Live. 
For more information on today's program, visit RERadioLive.com. That's RERadioLive.com. Subscribe to our podcast. Discover more at RERadioLive.com.